Welcome to the Clothing Center piece, Revisioning Health Economics. In 1999, at the closing plenary of IHEAS Congress, Victor Fuchs delivered a speech on the future of health economics, where he discussed health economics as a behavioral science and also as an input to health policy. More than 20 years have passed, much has been advanced in the field of economics, in particular behavioral economics, organization economics, experimental economics that have now been considered mainstreams. There have also been innovations in econometrics and many other methodologies, and all of these have been increasingly and productively applied to health economics. The field of health economics as measured by the number of researchers, publications, new journals, new degree programs around the world have also expanded extensively. Well, the planning committee of this Congress thought it is perhaps time for us to pause and reflect how well is health economics as a field positioned to address and is respond to future challenges, such as our desire to achieve universal health coverage, reducing inequalities in many aspects of health and healthcare, all these are goals of the SDGs, to prepare for an aging society, and needless to say, to manage and recover from the current pandemic and to better prepare for future global pandemics. We thought it may be productive and interesting to look outside the traditional health economics field for someone to come in and share new thinking and ideas from other fields that might bring inspirations to the area of health. Today, we are very honored to have Mariana Masucado as our keynote speaker to share her new ideas on reimagining health innovation for public value. Mariana Masucado is professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London, where she is the founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Her work challenges orthodox thinking about the role of the state and the private sector in driving innovation, how economic value is created, measured, and shared, and how market shaping policy can be designed in a mission-oriented way to solve the grand challenges facing humanity and to promote economic growth that is inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. She's winner of international prizes, including the 2020 John von Neumann Award and the 2018 Leon Thier Prize for Advancing the Frontier of Economic Thought. She's also the chair of the Council on the Economics of Health for All that are recently established by the World Health Organization. Before I turn the stage to Mariana, I want to highlight two messages from Victor Fuchs in 1999 that I thought would rest, you would resonate. First, Victor Fuchs wrote, institutions matter, but many economists do not pay enough attention to institutions. Second, he commented, economists are naive if they think that, if they expect that good economic research with strong results will translate immediately into policy. Policy depends on analysis and on values. So sensitivity to that interaction would make economists more useful contributors to help policy. With these in mind, wisdoms in mind, um, and before I turn the stage to um, Mariana, I'd like to remind the audience that this session is being recorded and we welcome you and encourage you to put in your question at the Q&A box, not the chat box. And um, with that, um, I would like to turn the stage to Mariana. We look forward to your insights and inspirations. Mariana, over to you. It's tell hello there. It's telling me I can't turn on the video. So I think someone on ah. your side. There we go. Start my video. Very good. Hello. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, thank you so much, Winnie. And, and it's a real honor to uh, be here. And thanks for inviting me. Um, and I'm so glad I also heard what, um, you know, what, what uh, Victor's uh, uh, discussion was about, because I'm very much going to be building on that. I really see the economy itself as an outcome of how we design and how we govern all the different types of organizations and institutions that create value. 
and also how they interrelate. And I think there's too little economic analysis that actually looks at that. So for example, you know, our public organizations, whether it's the BBC or the National Institutes of Health or a digital agency for a city, what is its remit? How is it governed? You know, does culture matter within the public sector in order to deliver the public good? Um, and also how do we design relationships between public and private that are truly symbiotic and mutualistic. If you talk to any biologist, of, of which I'm sure there's uh, many on the, uh, or at least with biological training, many uh, listening, they will stop you if you try to just act neutral about the word ecosystem. And in my world, which is the kind of economics of innovation world, we're constantly talking about innovation ecosystems. Biologists would stop you and say, well, what kind of ecosystem? Is it predatory? Is it symbiotic? Is it mutualistic? Is it parasitic? So, you know, what are the kind of metrics and design features that we need in order to build truly dynamic, creative, symbiotic, public-private partnerships that can really foster collective intelligence? And I'll come back to that concept of collective intelligence because I think with COVID-19 and issues around the vaccine, it's been sort of elevated as a very important word. We need to unpick what we mean by that. So before I do anything else, let me share my slides. Here we go. Just one second, please. I'm gonna to have to turn it into presentation mode. There we go, good. Um, and so I've, I've called this reimagining health innovation to deliver public value. And so what I wanna do is focus a bit about the innovation part and then the public value part, and then also to bring them together. And a lot of what I'll be talking about is sort of featured in my last three books where I talk about in the first book, Entrepreneurial State, the kind of missing story about state institutions, right? You know, we all know that public investment is important for basic infrastructure, for education, even, you know, R&D, but the more entrepreneurial risk-taking role of the state has often been dismissed precisely because we talk about the role of the state as something that I'll talk about in the first couple of minutes of, at best fixing a market failure. You know, what does it look like to be co-creating and co-shaping markets between public and private? In the second book, I then asked, well, what would be the underpinning of a co-creation, co-shaping mechanism and of the state taking risks to deliver actually around public goals like the SDGs that you just mentioned? What is the underlying political economy that would be needed for that? And why do we have to also rethink value outside just of a production function kind of setting in order to truly understand the role of the state as not just redistributing, not just leveling, not just a fixing markets. What's the value theory that's needed for that? Um, and also how can we make sure that we're socializing, not just the risks, but also the rewards. In the more recent book, which came out just a couple months ago, it kind of turned more into a recipe book, <laughs> which brought the first two books together, which is, all right, well, how do you actually do this stuff? What would it look like to actually design policies from a market shaping perspective putting public purpose at the center, what would it mean for how you design procurement strategy, industrial strategy, innovation policy, if we actually cared about the goals? You know, think about the goals and then work backwards, what does it mean for the economy? And I should say that that's also why I was really happy and honored to be asked by Dr. Tedros to set up the um, WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All, because I think that while there's really good work showing you know, that investing in health is also good for the economy, sometimes we need to think of it in the other way as well, which is invest in health for all. Why? Because it's a good thing to do in and of itself, regardless of the economy, and then work backwards and ask, what does it actually mean for the economy? What does it mean for how we think about budgeting, outcomes-based budgeting? What does it mean for dynamic procurement to really foster as much innovation and investment towards areas that are needed? for our health systems, but also broader health goals? What does it mean for the design of the contracts, literally the contracts inside the public-private partnerships? What does it mean for the capacity that we need within our public administrations? And I you know, look at different examples and health is a big uh, one of those, um, different types of health missions and moonshots. Um, so let me just begin with a kind of key first points around rethinking the state and innovation. Um, I do think it re requires a complete rethink for the reasons that I've already sort of mentioned that we have a very siloed way to think about the role of policy, of public institutions and the state more generally. And it's not about capitalism versus communism. It's actually about also looking back at the history of capitalism and you know, making sure that we haven't again dismissed or put into a silo our understanding of the state's role. 
And what does it also mean for the future? You know, if we care about things like inclusive growth, sustainable growth, a green transition, a green deal, a healthy green deal, what does that mean for the design of public policy, but also the, the remit of the state itself? Um, and I think the reason also this is so important, this discussion is that, you know, luckily we've stopped actually just talking about the rate of growth. You'll know that just before the financial crisis, there was no problem in the rate of growth. There was plenty of growth. It was just a very problematic type of growth. And I think especially after the financial crisis and since we've had the uh, 17 sustainable development goals, there's been more talk, not enough, but more talk about the directionality of growth, the fact that we actually need to meet goals like the SDGs, but even broader ones uh, around you know, smart, inclusive, sustainable growth. Those words were plastered all over Brussels where I go to a lot for uh, discussions about research, innovation, and, and different forms of policies. Uh, but what does it actually then mean? What does it mean for how we direct growth to be smarter, more inclusive, and sustainable? And by the way, these aren't just kind of trendy words. I'm standing here today in the UK, um, and the form of growth we have is not investment-led, it's not innovation-driven, it's not sustainable, it's not inclusive, as is true in many different countries. Uh, even just looking at a, a, a classic GDP, uh, metric, which we all know that can be improved with all sorts of issues around wellness, well-being, and so on that people like Amartya Sen have been writing about for a long time. Even with the classic GDP accounting framework, we could, if we wanted to, depending what we're trying to see, see this problematic form of growth. So in the UK, we are mainly growing through consumption. You know, GDP, C plus I plus G plus X minus M, the C bit is mainly how we're growing. And that consumption, not investment, is mainly fueled by private debt. So the ratio of private debt, not public debt, what everyone worries about, private debt to disposable income is actually back at record levels to the level it was just before the financial crisis. And that's what caused the financial crisis. You would think this would be on the front pages of the Financial Times, or at least in the election manifestos last round. No, it's missing. Um, and so even if we had investment-led growth, which we don't have, uh, what would it mean to redirect that investment in both public and private towards actually achieving you know, solutions to problems we have? Um, and there's also something very important, and I'll touch on it later because I've worked with quite a few governments on this, a return of industrial strategy. And you know, looking at industrial strategy, not just as a list of random sectors that a government should support, you know, life sciences, automotive, financial services, creative sector. These are some of the ones that used to be in the UK industrial strategy but a way to actually galvanize all sectors in an economy, potentially also new sectors that are in the process of, of forming to work together towards solving problems. This is something I worked on in my, again, recent book called Mission Economy, where I looked at how the Apollo program was just that. You know, getting to the moon and back was not just an aerospace venture. It required innovation, investment, creativity, new forms of collaboration and sectors as different as health, nutrition, materials, electronics, the whole software industry in some ways was a spillover of that. If you're interested in that, read the book. I'm not gonna be talking about Apollo today. Um, and of course, also with COVID-19, so many of the recovery funds globally, and there's a big pot of money in both Europe and the US, you'll know, but also globally, different countries are trying to build back better. And what does it mean to make sure that we structure the COVID-19 recovery funds so they're not just kind of helicopter money, you know, trillions going into infrastructure or, or, or even areas like health, but actually making sure that we're building stronger, better, more resilient forms of, of health systems, but also different types of infrastructure. So greener infrastructure, not just cement and bricks on our roads and so on. So all these words are, are wonderful, you know, the Green Deal, wow. But what does it then mean for how we think about the role of policy? And you know, this is where we have the problem <laughs> uh, and why I often talk about the need to rethink economics also because practitioners continue to be informed by, I think, as Kane said, defunct economics. Economics that actually doesn't speak to the ambition, the vision, the mission of everything I was just talking about. Why is that? Because we've kind of gotten stuck thinking that at best the state can fix market failures. Um, and these market failures do exist. You'll know the, the classic ones around positive externalities like public goods, you know, the state investing in say basic R&D or negative externalities, the state coming in with a carbon tax or information asymmetries, the state coming in and 
providing some small medium enterprise financing, uh, coordination failures, you know, counter cyclical lending, so on and so forth. So it's not that those market failures don't exist. And I think the framework is a strong one. We shouldn't throw it out. The problem is, can you actually patch your way to actually transforming a system to make it more sustainable, healthier, more green, more inclusive? And I think the answer is no. Um, a lot of bandages are not going to make a stronger body. <laughs> you need a, you know, a, a proper medicine and a proper diagnosis. And I think this idea that we should not just be fixing markets, but co-creating and co-shaping markets to deliver on these goals with both public and private being equally ambitious also about their institutional structures, as we just mentioned, is, is key. But it also requires changing the, uh, the narrative, the storytelling. You know, these are just such boring words, the ones you see here. <laughs> you know, at best, you're there, again, fixing different types of failures, setting the rules of the game, and then get out of the way so the real players can play that game in the playing field. You know, de-risking, de-risking who? The risk takers that are somewhere else in the private sector, enabling, incentivize, facilitating. This is the word I hate the most. I'm Italian, so, you know, in Latin and in Italian, facile means making things easier. Uh, and you'll remember Kennedy's speech with the Apollo program. He said, we're going to do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. So what does it mean to actually confront taking on difficulties together, not one actor trying to de-risk and facilitate things, making them easier for another actor? It's a very different type of vocabulary. Um, and even, you know, after the financial crisis where central banks and different types of public loans actually bailed out, so much of the private sector and saved capitalism, but also where you have so many different types of public funds, as I'll talk about in a minute, taking on the early stage high risk investments, especially in areas like health. Why do we keep talking about the role of the state as a lender of last resort, as opposed to an investor of first resort? And so all these boring words create this boring image of the state there that you see on the right, that's Kafka in the middle who wrote a lot about bureaucrats. So black and white, purely, in an administrative role, a redistributary role, a fixing role, whereas the colorful private sector there with, um, with uh, 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 Zuckerberg and others, even though, well, anyway, I still think Kafka is more good looking there than Zuckerberg, but still Zuckerberg is supposed to look like the colorful place where you wanna go work, you wanna work in Facebook, Google, even Goldman Sachs, God forbid, and you know, consulting companies, somehow they're seen as being at the heart of the action of value creation, whereas the state is on the side just doing some of the basic stuff, you know, horizontal types conditions, and then please get out of the way. And this is even, I mean, I'm sort of creating a, a, a how do you say, cartoon image here, but, you know, I think it's a, it's a real cartoon image. So if we depict the state in this way, where would you prefer to go work? Why don't we have enough of our best and brightest students wanting to go into the civil service as like the best, coolest place to be? Why do we continue to use the word bureaucratic as a negative word, you know, states need bureaucracies. That shouldn't be a negative word. The problem is that we have rigid, unagile, inflexible, slow bureaucracies. And why is that? Could it be that we have a self-fulfilling prophecy that the more we talk about the state in a particular way, the more we get that kind of state? Um, also, because we haven't then nurtured its own capacity to rethink its own structures, tools in order to be co-creating and co-shaping. And yet what's so interesting, and, and this is really the thesis of uh, my book, The Entrepreneurial State, is if you just look at history, the history of technological change, which you'll know is really important for long run growth. It's kind of what differentiates feudalism from capitalism, technology and, and, and that kind of organizational and technological change. We wouldn't have actually had these massive changes in technology and what economists call general purpose technologies, which really affect production, distribution, consumption, and you know, intersectoral differences in productivity had we not had a particular type of state which that, uh, that, that kind of depiction of at best being a cheerleader on the side uh, depicts. Um, and so what I did in the entrepreneurial state is look at different sectors and, and I'll get to health in a minute, but you know, even just something as sexy as our iPhone and there's lots of talk about Silicon Valley, there's not enough understanding about how everything that makes our smart products smart and not stupid were actually state investments in organizations like DARPA that came up with the internet, the Navy that came up with GPS, but also the Siri voice activated system, the touchscreen display. These are all outcomes of public investments, which doesn't mean the state produced the iPhone. No, <laughs> that would be ideology, but it does mean that what made it smart 
was very much a result of public investment. Then, of course, you needed private initiative to package it up to make it look good. And you want to use that phone because it's user friendly and very well designed. And that itself is an important skill. It's an intangible skill around areas like design and simplicity. If, if, if you read uh, Steve Jobs' book, there's a lot of his obsession about simplicity. But the fact that actually a lot of these investments from these public organizations were risk taking. You know, for every internet, there's many failures. For every GPS, there's many failures. So what does that look like actually to talk about that risk taking role? But also within these organizations, how were they structured? They weren't actually obsessing about the technology. They were trying to solve problems. So DARPA didn't say, oh, we need the internet. Let's go invest in it. Like people today talk about AI, quantum computing, driverless cars. Actually, driverless cars is a separate point, which relates to what I'm about to say. They were worried about problems. So getting the satellites to communicate required the internet. That's why the internet came about. It was solving a problem. And so really the question of how can we actually explicitly talk about the direction of growth, but also how we need particular types of organizations that are really trying to solve problems and seeing the innovation and the technology, and it, in many ways, the science is a spillover of that because of the problem that you have at hand. What does that look like? Why do we speak so little about that? Why do we not in our econometric models even have a dummy variable that says whether a certain type of public funding was or was not kind of purpose and mission oriented, given that we know that it was actually mission oriented organizations in the state that have been so critical actually for fostering so much of that innovation. Furthermore, even though we admit, you know, the basic R&D bit, I don't think we get just how broad and deep the role of the state has been around technological change. So it's not just upstream research and then you expect venture capital to come in and do the rest or the private sector. In so many different sectors, what has been required is both upstream R&D by the public sector, more downstream uh, ways to facilitate the exchange of science and industry and in organizations like in Germany, the Fraunhofer's or in the UK, we have the catapult centers and so on even further downstream patient long-term finance, uh, whether it's through development banks, which increasingly have VC funds within the public banks. But in the US, for example, this has also occurred through the SBIR funding, Small Business Innovation Research Funding, which is, uh, occurs through procurement. So 3% of each department's uh, procurement is dedicated to actually fostering innovation by small medium enterprises for public uh, uh, goals. That's in health and de in, uh, defense and energy and so on, but also public venture capital funds like InQtel, very important in the US. InQtel is actually owned by the CIA, uh, but in, in, in Israel, Yozma, public venture capital fund, and even further downstream, demand side policies, especially around the green uh, uh, um, revolution. This is incredibly important in Scandinavia. In fact, they have a lot of demand side policies, which is why Tesla, the car, not only got supply side uh, loans, uh, from the, U the US Department of Energy, but also on the demand side was able to benefit from a huge demand pull in countries like uh, Norway, where at some point it was 30% of Tesla cars were, were sold there. So government as purchaser precisely actually through not only procurement policy, but also through um, policies that change how consumers demand, for example, taking tax off of uh, you know, electric vehicles and being able to ride in the taxi lane of a motorway, that would be a demand side policy. Um, and the NIH, of course, has been very important in the United States in terms of supplying that kind of you know, uh, upstream funding. I think what would be very interesting, and I'll get to this later, is also to start thinking of the health funding itself as distributed across the whole chain. What we actually have is often a, 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 a division. So on the, on the end, we have things like Medicare and Medicaid in the US or in many different countries, the healthcare system, which can act on the demand side but it's not actually well integrated with the, uh, uh, um, with the upstream funding. And that's different by the way, for the military. You know? So when, for example, um, DARPA, which is in the Department of Defense, which is, I already mentioned, funded uh, the internet, when it funds health, which it does, because soldiers die in the battlefield, or BARDA, um, they do actually care about the demand side and they do care about also getting the prices right of the drugs that are funded by DARPA. And this is you know, very interesting, I'll come back to this later. When I gave a, a keynote at the National Institutes of Health recently, I asked, 
do you not care about the prices of the drugs that you're financing? You got 40 billion going in a year. How come the prices of the drugs don't reflect that? And why have you never used the margin rights that the NIH has in theory uh, legal access to? And I think the answer is just like the lack of confidence, right? And also the, in some ways, the wariness that that's not their role, that their role is to push the kind of science funding and then someone else will get the prices right, will get the redistributory part of the sort of welfare state right. And I think that's a, a problematic way of thinking, given that these are public funds. How can we make sure the patents, right, the intellectual property rights are actually structured in such a way that really do uh, take into account this huge amount of money? And I, sorry, I should have put this uh, slide on earlier. So as I, as I mentioned, you know, huge amounts close to this, sorry, this data is from uh, 2018. It was uh, close to 40 billion. Last year, 2020, the last time I looked, it was just over 40 billion actually. But if you look at, at the NIH spending again from the beginning until now, we're talking about a huge amount in real terms. And the question is, is that enough? Is it enough just to put in the money? What does it look like to really start asking questions on how to structure these funds, but also how much do we know about the NIH itself or other similar public funding bodies globally? What is their remit? How do they describe themselves? Do they describe themselves as just fixing market failures? And the answer is no. You know, you don't need fancy kind of metrics just to kind of Google some of the important uh, public actors in the history of innovation. And, you know, they have missions. So NASA's mission, ARPA-E's mission, ARPA-E is the equivalent of DARPA, but in the Department of Energy, NIH's mission, the KFW, which is a public bank's mission. Often if you read the mission statements, but also listen to the people inside and how they describe their role, it really is about transforming landscapes and also going for kind of, you know, big goals. And yet we haven't really figured out the kind of economics of that and also what it means for the design of those very institutions, but also the design of the system, because surely it's not enough just to put in money and then to hope for the best. But another thing that's interesting, if you look at OECD data in terms of funding of innovation by governments and how governments then help also the private sector to directly fund innovation for their own um, you know, business funding about R&D, you see a, a, a big difference between countries in terms of not only the amount of government funding of R&D, but also the, the division between direct funding, which basically all the examples I gave of DARPA, NIH would be, versus indirect uh, funding so through, through different types of tax incentives. And those are the lighter blue uh, colors that you see there. And, you know, and what I've seen, and I've done sort, sort of a very preliminary analysis, but those countries that over rely on indirect incentives, what's interesting is it doesn't actually really get the private sector to invest. It doesn't cause additionality, getting private sector investment that wouldn't have happened anyway. Um, and that's because what actually drives business investment, and I speak to businesses uh, around the world a lot, so I'm just going to sit down for a minute, um, is the expectations of where future opportunities lie. So if you're just providing tax incentives and not direct investments in new areas that increase the expectations, or what Keynes would have called animal spirits, that actually then ends up not increasing business investment. And what's interesting is if you then look across the world at business funding of R&D, you can actually see that those countries that tend to have higher business R&D investments are also ones that have a more well-balanced distribution of direct and indirect and don't over rely on those indirect incentives, which tend to often just increase profits and not investment. And if you haven't checked recently, uh, global profits are at a record high <laughs> in terms of the profit share of GDP, global GDP, and the labor share is at a record low. And really getting these profits, instead of being hoarded or used for financialized uh, purposes like share buybacks, to be reinvested into the economy is very important. So what are the kinds of policies that can kind of galvanize and catalyze, crowd in private sector investment? This is a big um, question. And by the way, even R&D tax credits, I've studied them quite a bit, you know, they often fail in, in terms of, again, on that additionality check or the patent box, which you'll know in health is very important. Patents are already a monopoly for 20 years. So monopoly profits for 20 years, you don't necessarily have to reduce tax on monopoly profits. That's already taken care of by the monopoly. What you need to do is complement the monopoly with policies that actually really make sure that we get a, a reinvestment of those profits into the economy. And that uh, uh, isn't about reducing the tax on the profits, but something else. And, 
that kind of broader portfolio of different types of policies that I mentioned before are very important. So anyway, that's really just to uncover a lot of the myths around where innovation comes from, this you know, problematic way that we've thought about the role of the state. And I wanna spend the last kind of five to a bit more minutes uh, looking at some of the solutions of, of how to do that in such a way that isn't, again, uh, simply saying, oh, the state is important, you know, recognize its role, but also how can we structure that role? How can we structure these public investments, which are important, that's the first bit, have been important for driving uh, entrepreneurship and, and technological change in the history of capitalism, but how can we also govern it for the public good? And I think it's so interesting to ask this question, especially, but not only in the area of health, that's sorry, a picture of me self-promoting myself with uh, Elizabeth Warren, um, Elijah Cummings, and, uh, and another person who was also giving alongside myself uh, evidence to the Senate, uh, I think it was back in 2016, around this question, you know, around the question of how can we not only think about public funding of health, but also make sure it's actually delivering, you know, for the good of the citizens who to a large extent are paying for that research in the first place through tax revenue. And more recently, I helped uh, write a report called The People's Prescription, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, which in some ways very much is the backbone of, of what's become the people's vaccine. We use the same word and actually are saying a lot of the same things, but our report was more about the, the general concepts of how can you make sure that health innovation is truly delivering public value? Um, what does it mean for the governance structure? And this has, of course, become a huge issue right now with the vaccine, which of course is a an outcome of huge amounts of both public and private investment. If you look at the public investment around the six different types of vaccines we have, there's different figures out there. Um, it's, 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 it's not only a large amount, but if you look at when it came in around both the AstraZeneca one, the Pfizer one, the Johnson & Johnson one, it was in the early, early high risk stage of that investment. Um, it's often true even with you know, re renewable energy, it's the early, stage of solar and wind when those innovations were also more capital intensive. So again, coming back to this idea of the entrepreneurial state, it's not just the public money, but also when is that public money coming in? If it's coming in at that earlier high risk stage, the probability of failure is also much higher. And what does that again mean for how we think about risks and rewards, but also that true kind of collaboration and collective value creation that we should be thinking about. And in the People's Prescription Report, which you can get online, it's a, a collaboration between my institute, the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and some uh, other groups that so were really trying to unpick some of the, the problems we have in the health uh, innovation space by not actually talking about you know, the role of public investment in this entrepreneurial way, but also not governing the process to meet citizen needs. And we looked at it across four different dimensions around directionality, uh, around the rate of innovation, what happens when we actually have too much patenting and too much upstream patenting that's blocking kind of collective intelligence because patents also have become a, a very wide, increasingly wide used for strategic reasons, increasingly strong uh, in terms of being hard to license. What does it mean for access issues when the prices of the therapies, of the drugs, of the vaccines aren't taking into consideration this collective uh, value creation process? And, and how about also looking at the financing of innovation itself, because finance isn't neutral. If we have finance that is overly uh, emphasizing short-term gains um, and also leading to what I call the financialization of different sectors. And you see this in terms of share buybacks, which across the S&P 500 companies in the last 10 years came up to something like uh, $4 trillion were used just to buy back shares, to boost stock prices, stock options and executive pay. What does it mean to actually think about that reinvestment cycle I mentioned before, but also the quality of the finance, patient, long-term finance, and not the kind of inpatient finance that we've had in, in sectors like the biotech sector, which by being so full of venture capital funding, which is exit-driven, venture capitalists want to exit in three or five years, what does it mean for science-based sectors to be rushed? And, and what you see actually in the biotech sector is... Uh, a lot of plepos, productless IPOs, because that exit happens through an IPO or a buyout. And we came up with certain proposals, which I wanted to go through here, because these are very much ones I pick up also in my book. They're sort of the foundation of it, which is, you know, in order to, to meet the directionality challenge, what does it mean to have a mission-oriented approach to health outcomes? In terms of the, um, the access issue, what does it mean to de-link innovation funding from high prices? 
uh, what does it mean to also achieve a public return for public investment in terms of the conditions that are attached to public funding and also alternative ownership in corporate governance models that go beyond just maximizing shareholder value for large pharmaceutical companies. And it's not a, it's not a, a bashing exercise of big pharma. We know, you know, big pharma is, an, you know, does innovate a lot and is absolutely important in that ecosystem. But it's really about how do we govern that system, those institutions that was talked about in the beginning uh, better. Um, and, you know, also what are the different framings, you know, from a market fixing to a mission oriented framing in terms of, again, government's role in terms of how to think about knowledge, appropriability of knowledge versus accessibility and collective intelligence, structuring a patent sim system to uh, uh, foster that collective intelligence, uh, access in terms of also socializing not only risks but rewards. This is very important also with COVID-19 recovery funds as we see how they are currently in many countries not including conditionality. So a lot of kind of subsidies, bailouts, guarantees without much of an ask of what you know, comes from that. Uh, but also this issue of finance, how can we make sure to really focus more on the long-term patient finance, especially for these um, areas that are science-based. And I'll just kind of quickly go here to the um, ending. This, this work is also stuff that I've been doing with different governments, which is to say, instead of having that kind of industrial and innovation strategy that ends up just kind of handing out money to random sectors, technologies, and firms. What if we really did learn from the Apollo program, start with a challenge, and I always say, go back to the SDGs, given that every company, uh, country signed up to them, 2015, those are the challenges. What does it mean to turn them into moonshots that require lots of different sectors to innovate, to invest, to collaborate, and to really redesign the instruments on the ground, like procurement grants and loans, to foster that you know, bottom-up, serendipitous experimentation that's required to, to kind of get there. And so whether it's you know, climate change, clean oceans, that's, that's not going to you know, get us much change unless we make concrete targets, like getting to the moon and back. You could say, yes or no, did we get there? So around climate change, having carbon neutral cities that require lots of different sectors, not just a random list, to collaborate, invest, and innovate from energy, real estate, food, and so on. But also, again, what does it mean to approach a procurement strategy to really foster that bottom-up experimentation? And there are just some examples here of projects, but there would be you know, 500, 1,000 projects that would be needed. And that kind of you know, admission that some of those might fail. So what does it mean to welcome risk-taking, to welcome uncertainty also within all sorts of institutions? And you know, for kind of the government role to be also picking the willing, not just picking winners, again, random lists, but really picking those that are willing, providing that long-term patient finance to organizations that are willing to experiment around these important public goals. In the UK, we helped to redesign, this is through my institute, the UK industrial strategy around four broad challenges, one of them, which is around healthy aging, clean growth, the future of mobility, instead of, again, that sectoral approach. And what that meant then is if you look at the aging society, one that the government worked on, you know, it, the, the mission they ended up choosing was to reduce the number of years of life lived with age-related functional decline while diminishing the loneliness, dependency, and impaired sense of self-worth experienced in those years. So actually, this is the one we tried to help them uh, uh, think about because the one that they uh, 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 stuck with in the beginning was to enhance capabilities and the quality of life across the course of our increasingly longer lives, which is you know, a mission that itself would require lots of different sectors. You see there on the screen, on the bottom, for those who can see them are just examples of projects, but this would be instead of what? Instead of just having a life sciences strategy, right? Just putting in a lot of money and again, hoping for the best. What does it mean to really ask oneself, what are the challenges we're facing and how to approach an industrial strategy, which is also problem-based, purpose-oriented, mission-oriented. But also, what are the organizations you need on the ground? We actually elevated through the People's Prescription Report some early writings that now have actually come back with the Biden administration around setting up a HARPA, like DARPA, but so an ARPA-H, and what that means, again, for institutions like DARPA in terms of their flat, nimble, non-bureaucratic structure, uh, you know, a very explicit risk-taking role um, to think about, again, kind of a portfolio setting, uh, but, but also thinking about how to make sure that the structure itself, the culture within the institution is one that uh, uh, evaluates itself also by how much risk it actually was willing to take. This is something I learned from the head of ARPA-E, Cheryl Martin, 
who said that they actually evaluated RFAE by how much risk it was willing to take, but also how much economy-wide success, sorry, impact these successes have. So again, looking at that kind of organizational dimension of mission-oriented uh, institutions. I won't say much about the delinking innovation funding from high prices, because I think there's a lot on that, and I'm sure people have read literature on this, but you know, thinking about price schemes also as ways to fund innovation and health, as opposed to assuming that the price itself of the drug is going to be what incentivizes you to invest. When I was looking at the uh, uh, moon landing, it was so interesting to me to see that NASA cared about that. They changed the procurement from being cost plus to being fixed price, which is like a price scheme, but with constant incentives for innovation and quality improvement. They also had a no excess profits clause because it was a risk sharing, a collective value creation. So the idea that the companies that were working with NASA wouldn't be earning in excess of what they actually did precisely because it was a collective enterprise. Uh, they also cared very much, by the way, to continue to invest within their own organization's capabilities in order not to be captured by what the head of procurement in NASA called brochuremanship. So to even know which companies to collaborate with and to know how to write the terms of reference, they were very clear that they themselves had to be intelligent. Um, third point that we raise in the, in the report, which I also reflect on again in, in the various books, is how can we govern innovation also through the contracts themselves, you know, through conditions. So instead of just putting money in, there's also conditions attached, whether it's characteristics of the patents, making sure they're not too upstream, not too wide, not too strong, making sure that there is that reinvestment of profits that are earned by a collective value creation machine. That's, by the way, how we got Bell Labs, very important private sector innovation laboratory came about when the U.S. government pressured AT&T in order to retain its monopoly status. It had to reinvest back into the economy, innovation and big innovation beyond telecoms, Bell Labs was the answer versus the kind of massive hoarding and share buybacks, lack of reinvestment we have today. Also conditions around um, sharing, knowledge sharing. It was so interesting to me to see the very different conditions that were set by the Oxford scientists with the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine from the Pfizer vaccine in terms of really negotiating, making sure it was a good deal given that there was public investment, both in the cost, the prices, the patent, uh, a sharing and so on. Um, and access and affordability, very important to have transparent R&D costs, um, also issues around kind of those march in rights I talked about before, and really just making sure you're negotiating a good deal. I always say that the, with the word green deal, we know the green bit, as Greta Thornburg says, listen to the science, the deal requires a new social contract. And, and without that, we end up with the kind of anti-commons uh, uh, and also with a lot of uh, lack of transparency in terms of what these uh, uh, two slides show you here, but it, it really doesn't actually foster that collective intelligence. Lastly, just to touch on this, this is I think my last two slides, the need to definancialize the corporate governance uh, of the sector. I think it is important because we're not talking about luxury cars. <laughs> we're talking about health and health for all as also an ultimate objective. Ideally, it's not there, but anyway, even just health, people die when they don't have it. So, you know, uh, who cares if we have a lot of share buybacks by Rolls Royce, we should care when we have an ultra financialized health uh, sector, which um, in this time period you see here actually spent over 61% of their combined R&D expenditures just in share buybacks. I already mentioned some of the figures before. Uh, here you see some of the biggest share buybackers. So um, uh, share buybacks as a percentage of net income uh, being as much as 71% in companies like Pfizer. And by the way, this is why there's a whole discussion globally by top businesses around the need to change this. It is seen as a problem. Uh, you know, it's seen as a problem of not actually um, fostering that kind of long run growth and just kind of focused on not only the share price, but different activities which are focused on those short term returns, which are precisely those that also then end up misgoverning uh, the patent system. And the way it's often talked about is in terms of a, a, a stakeholder value, not just shareholder value. Um, and one way to do this, you know, would in fact be to introduce rules to limit share buybacks, to change executive compensation, to incentivize long run investments in innovation, to take steps to improve stakeholder governance, to align corporate interests with the public interest, especially in a sector that does get all that public funding, to promote alternative ownership and governance models that promote public value creation when partnering with the private sector. And this might be really interesting to do at the project level itself, to experiment on specific public-private partnerships. 
uh, that are in fact governed in a different way. It's not necessarily about, again, socializing or nationalizing the sector, but really experimenting with a different type of sharing of both risks and rewards. And this would be a way to walk the talk and not just talk the talk of stakeholder value, uh, which in places like uh, Davos is often talked about. And lastly, I do think the COVID-19 moment is an interesting one with many of these ideas, both because you have a lot of public money going in, you have the Build Back Better agenda, which is saying, hold on a second, that's not enough. Let's actually make sure it makes all sorts of things better from our green or infrastructure to stronger health systems. But that requires conditionalities. And it was really interesting to me that the French uh, finance minister who you see here put conditions attached to companies like uh, Renault, Air France, that they had to reduce their carbon emissions in order to access the bailout they got during COVID-19. In Scotland and Austria and Denmark, they did um, they had uh, uh, laws that you couldn't access the COVID recovery scheme if you were evading your tax using a fiscal uh, havens, tax havens. Um, and um, what was I going to say? I mean, anyway, I think we need to normalize these kinds of conditionalities. It's not just during COVID-19. In, in Germany, the steel sector, for example, um, uh, the government put conditions attached to bailing out steel four years ago, the steel is asking for money everywhere, that they had to reduce the material content. How they did it, up to them. You can't micromanage innovation. That kills innovation. But the fact they had to do it to get a public loan has now made the German steel sector one of the most innovative and green in the world because they had to innovate in order to be uh, you know, reducing their material content. And you know, all these principles, I think, are really important ones for rethinking health for all. And that's why, again, I was really happy to be asked to chair this wonderful council. It is all women. And as Dr. Tedros tweeted here, when asked why all members are women, Professor Matsukata and I say, why not? <laughs> Think how many councils weren't before, or all men. Anyway, what we're trying to do in the council is also to unpick lots of these issues around value. How do you think about values collectively created? How can we think about innovation, a second very important thing we're going to be looking at, governed by these kind of common good characteristics? How can we think about financing and finance itself, structuring finance in order to deliver on goals, but also think about budgeting and public budgets really in a more outcomes-driven way? Um, and that whole issue of designing public-private partnerships in ways that really fuel, again, collective intelligence and as much creativity as possible while solving big problems, uh, uh, that's what, you know, is, is, I think, uh, very challenging but needed more than ever. So, thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for a very inspirational talk, sharing with us uh, many of your new ideas that um, now, um, we have a few questions which is centering around, and I'll summarize them, is as uh, what would be a moonshot for health economics, please? For health economics or for health policy? <laughs> uh, health policy I don't think policy, a moonshot's yeah. for the theorists. Um, I mean, to be honest, I don't think it's my role to do that. So, for, I mean, what I can say is what it's not, right? So, for example, a cancer mission wouldn't count, in my words, as a mission in terms of how I uh, wrote it up for the European Commission, where I had five criteria, uh, it, unless it actually is getting a lot of different sectors involved. So if thinking about a particular health-related mission, we're purely thinking about it with the, say, you know, health sector, uh, that, that is not as ambitious as it could be if it was really a moonshot that would require like going to the moon, investments in nutrition, in, mo in you know, mobility, in electronics and software and all those different areas that I mentioned. So thinking about cancer, for example, and all the preventative areas as well would already obviously uh, um, you know, start getting that intersectoral dimension. And there is a cancer uh, moonshot as there is also one around, again, clean growth and, and, and mobility in the European Commission on the back of some of this work I did with them. And it's interesting if, if you're interested in looking at the work that's being done by the mission board around cancer, it's precisely to make sure that that kind of ambition of real cross-sectoral and cross-actor innovation is being fostered as much as possible instead of just using the word mission to replace something that was already being done before. But, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to see also how linked inequality issues are with health. I mean, obviously, if you read the work of people like Michael Marmot and the socioeconomic determinants of health, um, or the work of Wilkinson and Pickett on the spirit level by two uh, epidemiologists, I think what's so interesting there is that it's really also the public health lens that can really help us solve other missions. In, in London, where I'm, again, sitting and standing today, we have a huge 
pandemic of knife crime amongst young, underprivileged, you know, really disadvantaged, mainly boys. And so seeing it through a public health lens instead of a crime lens, instead of a policing lens, right? So I think health can provide a really interesting lens for missions that are also not strictly health missions like knife crime or the digital divide and so on, precisely coming back to that kind of social and economic determinants of health uh, uh, criteria, which I think is so important. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you highlighted um, the important new messages of rather than just the, the just the position of the government versus the market, which is typically what we do, right? The role of the government versus the market is, of course, a major question in healthcare, in health mm. and in healthcare financing and in delivery. And as you have started, um, we typically start with saying the market fails, therefore the government needs to intervene. But it gets into a certain circle in the sense, in the sense that um, the private market in some way emerges, especially in many low and middle income countries, it's precisely the government, the state doesn't have the capacity yeah. to deliver or to finance. And then here we're coming back to say that we would like the state to be um, more innovative, taking risks to procreate with the private sector and uh, with the market. I mean, in a way, it's very, um, of course, it's very, it's a very new, fresh way of looking at it rather than one or the other. It is procreation yeah. and working together. So, a number of questions that come in um, center around this question of, in especially in many low middle income countries, um, but I would say in advanced economies as well, the kind of government or, or the state, you didn't use the word government, yeah. you used the state, the kind yeah. of state you were talking about that is strategic, that is proactive, that is visionary, is missing on its own. And how do we how do we break that? How do we really build that capacity as a starting point? And then there are a few other questions which is much more specific to say that um, some of the government that they're familiar with low and middle income countries is extractive. And there's also questions in terms of trust. Um, if the government is um, corrupt, um, yeah. and what is the kind of social compact that you can make then between that sort of state and the people? So, so I think a number of questions centers around one is capacity, one is the extractive nature of the state, yeah. and third type is, um, I would say, um, trust. Um, so, so if you could um, shed some light on that, that would be great. Sure, really good questions. And by the way, I'm currently advising um, with a with the Council of Economic Advisors, the President of South Africa. And if you've read the news recently, all these issues are huge, huge in South Africa. Uh, but they're also true and, and huge in many countries, including my own in Italy, where you know the mafia is something everyone knows about because of Hollywood and all those great Hollywood movies on the mafia, um, including the recent series of uh, Sopranos. Uh, but the mafia actually came about because of a weak state. It came about mm -hmm. in Sicily as it, it was initially, initially called the Società dei Beati Paoli. And it was because Southern Italy had a failed state. And you know this is the, what happens in failed states. You end up with huge problems like the Italian mafia. So let me just say that, first of all, all these questions, why are they important? Because they are exactly the kind of starting point. I actually think we have incapable. I think we have a lot of weak states, even in the, the developed parts of the world. Recently, um, in fact, in, in part of the book, I talk about this, this massive outsourcing of state capacity to consulting companies, the PwCs and Deloitte's, has reduced state capacity to the point that Lord Agnew, a Tory Lord, a conservative Lord in the UK government, started looking at the numbers with both Brexit and COVID, where you know, companies like Deloitte were asked huge fees to do the test and trace system, and that's not exactly their expertise. He said that was infantilizing Whitehall. I thought that was such an mm -hmm. important word, the infantilization of government when government stops investing within its own capacity, something that NASA was so clear on and they said, we're going to get captured. You're going to have more nepotism, more corruption, unless we ourselves, NASA, is investing within its brain. So the reason I set up the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL, University College London, was precisely because it's impossible to have better policies unless you have better structures. So the question is, what are the dynamic capabilities of the public sector? What is the training? Literally, what is the curriculum we would want? And an MPA, you know, MBA is Master's in Business Administration, 
Masters in public administrations continue to be fed by a very defunct notion from public choice theory and new public management, uh, which has even convinced many civil servants that government failure is even worse than market failure. So do as little as you can and step out of the way. Or the opposite, which is the, the, the question was alluding to partly, when you have sort of a big state <laughs> taking up a lot of things and state-owned enterprises without really a discussion within the state of what is it for? What is public value? If anyone is interested in this concept of public value, I've written quite a bit about it, but also we just did a report for the BBC because it talks about public value. We asked, what does it mean for how you make your decisions? Because if you're just fixing markets, you do what PBS does in the States, is high quality news documentaries. The BBC also did soap operas, also did talk shows, but with a metric of public value. So EastEnders, you know, basically a soap opera on the working class is very different from Dallas and Dynasty. Now that's a bit of a simplistic uh, differentiation I'm making there, but still there was a huge debate within whether it was the right thing to do or not. So how can you use public value metrics to hold the state accountable that it's doing kind of the right thing? And so if you are a country like South Africa with large state-owned enterprises, which have also in the past been afflicted by corruption and you know, all sorts of other issues or, or many state-owned enterprises, which are often too bureaucratic, what are the conditions that should be set, not just in terms of the public private conditions I said before, this would be a public public condition in order to be state supported, to be a state owned enterprises, what kind of condition should be set for what your role is. And if you don't have that, which countries maybe that have problematic state enter enterprises don't have that, uh, but one is willing to change, you know, state bureaucracy and want to foster innovation, inclusive, uh, sustainable led growth, they have to start asking those questions about institutional design, the structure of the policies themselves. Um, and, you know, to build trust, I think one of the issues is also who sets the missions, you know, if we use the word mission, is it just as top down, you know, minister comes along or a president like Kennedy, we're going to do this, you know, because it's important, or how can you, especially around societal missions, really make the missions themselves as an outcome of, of social engagement and civil society engagement. So through citizen assemblies, uh, I'll give you an example in London in a very deprived part of London, but also a very rich part of London, as it's a microcosm of the world, Camden, where I live, we have the Knowledge Corridor, you know, Crick, the Wellcome Trust, British Library, British Museum, UCL, all sitting back to back to one of the most deprived parts of London called Summerstown. And so we started to ask, what does it mean actually to think about kind of inclusion and innovation at the same time? So these institutions start facing the estates instead of just having literally their bumps <laughs> to the estates, but also make the estates themselves. By estates, I mean the, the housing estates, like in America, they call them projects mm -hmm. or social housing, the, the funnels through which innovation occurs. So a carbon neutral agenda through the housing estates, but through the citizens who live in the housing estates, so resident associations or citizen assemblies, being in meetings, negotiating, debating together, what does it lo look like to live in a more sustainable way? So building kind of that trust and listening, kind of empathy, not sympathy, empathy, meaning you're putting yourself in other people's shoes, seeing the world through their eyes versus just feeling sorry for people through sympathy or charity, which I don't think will ever change anything through charity. We need new business models, but also a new design of the policy instruments themselves to be citizen focused and outcome focused. And that's really the, the core point of my book where I kind of unpack what it means for changing how we're currently doing things. Um, I think I've touched on your point there, capacity. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, developing countries, in my view, need this more than any other kind of country because the problems that are being faced are so big. So if you have a problem focused design of policy versus just a handout, which can lead, it's easier to capture the state when the state is just handing out money. So in Italy, again, where I come from, our public bank, which is called the Casa Depositi e Prestiti, has been part of the problem, not the solution, <laughs> because it literally just gives out money to whatever business or sector has the most lobbying power or loudest voice and, or connections, nepotism, versus, for example, in Germany, where the public bank uh, th that I mentioned before, the way it gave the loan to the steel sector was through a condition that steel had to change. It wasn't enough to say, help, help, I'm in trouble. Okay, you're in trouble, we'll help you, but then you must change and transform and be part of a societal you know, solution towards problems we're having in terms of, in, in that particular case, uh, renewable systems and, and sustainable production methods across all of manufacturing. So I think these issues of creating a conditionality between public, 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 private, 
investing within state capacity instead of just getting a bigger state, a smarter state that uses the full power of procurement grants and loans to foster innovation for the public good. This is especially important in developing countries. And lastly, the amount of finance, it's simply not true that there's no finance. Every country has a procurement budget. You can either waste it <laughs> or you can use it as a funnel for innovation. Just to give you a sense of the dimensions in the UK, but this is true everywhere in terms of the difference. In the UK, our whole innovation budget is 10 billion. Uh, this is pre-recent announcements. Um, whereas the, just the procurement budget of the Ministry of Transport, one ministry, Department of Transport is 40 billion. Imagine if all the procurement budgets of health, uh, uh, defense, uh, energy transport was used as a funnel for innovation and experimentation in that way, in some ways that NASA did for the moon landing, but around our SDG related goals, you've just, you know, created four times your, your innovation budget. So both with the money that exists, using it smarter. And lastly, you know, when we go to war, no one says there's no money. We do it. <laughs> Every country, unfortunately, also poor countries go to war and find the money for that. So we mm -hmm. do need to be asking ourselves, what are we treating as urgent? and kind of a security mm -hmm. risk? And why is it just a kind of military and not these social and health related goals? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very fascinated by the new MPA program that you're building. Good. Can you say <laughs> just a few words on um, what might be some of the defining characteristics that makes it different from existing MPA programs? Yeah, so we've chosen four modules through which we've also hired some absolute amazing thinkers around those four concepts and the four are the first one is on value kind of like really rethinking value and what the role of again a public civil servant is in collective value creation so for that pillar of the work we unpack existing value theory in economics and propose uh different <laughs> uh value theories partly kind of picking up on uh, my, my book called the value of everything but also you might know that mark carney has also just written a wonderful book called values where he also picks up on some of the same themes so just really kind of giving a lot of space to debunking a lot of the assumptions and myths that we have in economic theory about value, what it is and how it's created. The second is on um, uh, challenges and purpose oriented thinking, this whole notion of, you know, of missions, what does it mean for different types of policies? The third is on, um, oh God, now I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, creative bureaucracies. We, we look mm. like literally look at the kind of almost in a Veblen-esque kind of way at uh, uh, bureaucracies on the, around the world, how they're structured and what we can learn from good stories versus bad stories and scale up the interesting ways to formulate dynamic bureaucracies. Singapore is a really interesting example. So was Mind Lab in Denmark, which was an organization meant to really foster innovation within the public service, as opposed to just thinking it needs to move quicker and, and, and less red tape, which is a simplistic view. And the fourth is on this notion of design thinking and especially around digital platforms and kind of digital and design thinking together, you, you'll know that health, you know, is increasingly also having to govern uh, big data, but also a digital platforms. This is a huge issue, obviously, with the test and trace system. And so that's and so this idea that you're shaping and creating a market requires those four pillars. If you're just fixing a market, then it's fine to use new public management and public choice theory and to think you know, in that kind of older way. And again, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some interesting insights from these mm -hmm. other perspectives, but if we, if, if we want to foster a particular type of growth, inclusive, sustainable, we have to look back inside and ask exactly the previous question. What are the capabilities and capacity mm -hmm. you need? Um, and how do you avoid corruption, capture and all those issues, but from a more proactive way, instead of the fear of, you know, government being too big. Right. Um, one question and a, a few question is along the same line that is um, uh, for what you are proposing to do. Um, do you think that there will be constraints or maybe I would paraphrase it. Um, what do you anticipate are the challenges from the politicians, the, the politics of it? Mm -hmm. That is um, obviously um, you're talking about a uh, group of enlightened visionary um, statesmen um, who want to do this. And, um, but um, do you anticipate that what you're proposing um, would face political constraints? And I would say even um, the very visionary strategy to work with multiple sectors in order to achieve the moonshot, right? So you're yeah. not dealing with like one single sector, but really, I mean, if you look yeah. at the diagram that you uh, put together for aging society, it really speaks to how complex the situation is. 
and okay. but but how do you actually get to the um, practical step of making it happen and what are your thoughts on that yep so i mean in terms of the problems being faced by you know politicians ministers and the civil servants is if you're working in an institution that hasn't been making these kinds of investments that i'm talking about and hasn't been also rethinking its role it, it's going to be hard just to do it you know off the bat and say okay from today everything's fine it does require that um kind of proactive but also kind of distant look at your own organization like again you know what nasa did which was so interesting after the apollo 1 fire in 1967 they realized how badly they were structured um, one of the mm -hmm. astronauts, Gus Grissom, before dying, he was one of the three who died in the Apollo 1 fire, he yelled before dying, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? So, because he couldn't hear what was being said to him by mission, in, in the mission control room. And so that kind of, you know, government working in silos, you know, every department working on its own, that's a huge challenge faced by mm -hmm. government. So what does it mean to not just work intersectorally with business, but interdepartmentally? so mm -hmm. that any one ministry or, or department doesn't kind of just have its own little pet project and keep it all to itself, as opposed to really seeing this as redirecting growth. And I've learned about this recently because the European recovery scheme, which I've sort of helped advise in, in different ways, is um, you know, it's conditional a member state. So it's, it's called the next gen EU recovery scheme. It's about 2 trillion and it's conditional, no longer on austerity as the post financial crisis, <laughs> A recovery program was it's conditional on investment by member states around climate and basically the digital divide and digitalization um, and yet the capacity on the ground in the member states often isn't there and the risk is that instead of having kind of the challenge the mission the sectors and all the projects you end up with the reverse and just it just big shopping list of projects um, because that's what every ministry will say oh okay here's my project here's my project so really making sure that the sum is greater than the parts and you just don't end up with lots of little things which maybe particular people hold on to because they want some sort of legacy around a little project mm. is key. Mm -hmm. um, and so making sure that, you know, even a kind of renewable sort of green transition, green deal mission is not just about renewable energy, <laughs> but really transforming our mobility systems or our food systems and so on. And hence also the point about cancer not just being a health i think that's really important and useful for getting that kind of cross-departmental and cross-sectoral um mm -hmm. i saw in the chat actually something related to your question about cost benefit analysis you know mm -hmm. they would have never gone to the moon had they done a cost benefit analysis or a net present value calculation which doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention to costs of course you should and you know and that's why nasa did pay attention to how it devised its procurement and moved it away from cost, um, cost price, sorry, cost, uh, cost plus uh, procurement to fixed price with incentives for innovation. But it also does mean that we need better metrics for evaluating whether a mission is successful or not. You know, not only did they get to the moon and back, but so many innovations from baby formula, home insulation, camera phones, small computers, software, were spillovers of that. So even if they had actually you know, died along the way and not come back or just gotten stuck up there because the mission was to come back, not just get mm -hmm. there. Um, it would have probably still been successful in some ways in the sense of all those spillovers that happen along the way, right? So those bottom-up projects, those many homework problems that need to be solved along the way, like making these really small computers that could fit onto the lunar module and the data processing needs required for mission control room to talk to the lunar module, hence software, being a huge type of uh, and data analysis, being a huge spillover, we should be able to evaluate that in terms of the dynamic spillovers that occur cross sectorally ex post mission, whether the mission was or forget mission public investment is, is mm -hmm. successful or not. Instead, if you're just kind of using these really narrow cost benefit calculations, not only might you not even embark on really ambitious tasks around health, energy, knife crime, <laughs> uh, because the risk is very high that it might not work. Uh, but you might also ex post, even if it works, not actually really understand the value that you've created across the economy. Mm -hmm. So that's just to say that the challenge for these civil servants that you talked about and where some of the po political you know, bottlenecks might be, it's especially around these kind of lack of capacity to think in this way. And that's why we need investment in that. And of course, mm -hmm. there's also the fear of failure. And that's why I focus a lot on, well, you're going to have to admit that for every success, for every internet, there's many failures. For every Tesla investment that the U.S. government made, 
they, they gave a 465 million early stage loan to Tesla. There's many cylindros, same you know sector. It went bust, and government got blamed for that investment, but no one said, "Hey, well done for the Tesla one." And by mm -hmm. the way, really interesting on this, I, I often tell people this because it's fascinating. The Obama administration, which financed Tesla early on, said to Elon Musk, "If you don't pay back the loan, we want three million shares in your company," which makes no sense. You know, why would you want three million shares in a crappy company that doesn't pay back the loan? Tesla was a good company, did pay back the loan in 2013, and the price per share between 2009 2013 went from nine to 90 that multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the cylindra loss and the next round of investment so that kind of public venture capital you know kind of viewpoint means that you also end up socializing not just risks but also rewards and it mm -hmm. doesn't just have to happen monetarily it can also happen again through the conditions you're attaching to how to govern innovation for the common good around patents prices reinvestment, but also equity stakes. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, I have a few questions on um, relating to investment in information, health information system. Why do you think investment in health information system, you have services, healthcare analytics, these things which are so essential to business intelligence and other sectors um, seem to trail in the healthcare sector? It is important, but somehow it just doesn't seem to be um, uh, growing as fast as it, it should be. Yeah, and in fact, um, I helped the Scottish government set up a, what we call the mission-oriented national investment bank to prevent it from just being a handout machine like the Italian mm -hmm. one. Um, and one of the first missions they worked on was in fact digitalizing their own mm -hmm. kind of health service and the capacity of the health system to be really savvy uh, with big data and digital. I'm not saying they're there yet, but they saw that as a big investment to make because mm -hmm. of the weakness and the capacity. Um, so I would just agree that it's a really important area. It hasn't been invested in enough and it's critical. It kind of comes back to this issue that if we pretend that you have the welfare state here in the innovation Silicon Valley there, without actually saying that innovation through the welfare state could be a massive funnel for innovation and spillovers across the economy, which is something I, I really believe that we should be thinking of, you know, whether it's public education, public transport, public health, these are huge opportunities for innovation to occur through those funnels that require both public and private investment. Um, but if we continue to think of the care economy as a slow part of the economy, right? And then the cool high tech world there, obviously we'll be pouring more of our digital capacity and governance thinking in one side than the other. So I think as soon as you start prioritizing healthcare as not only incredibly important for all the reasons we realized with COVID-19 today, which is we, we have weak health systems, this crisis was worse than it had to be. You know, had it begun in Africa instead of China, we would all have globally been worse off because of weak health systems in Africa, but in many countries, even in the developed world, Again, in the UK where I live, we haven't been resourcing enough uh, uh, that part of the economy, and yet we, you know, talk in really ambitious ways about startups and having, you know, a, a, a science parks and this, that, the other, because we think that's where value occurs. So that reframing of value is much broader in terms of the location of where it's created. I think is critical as the first step to then justify why you need to be you know, digitally uh, uh, super smart and, and well-governed um, around data and, and, and the platforms. I mean, digital platforms are absolutely critical to every single sector, mm. if we care about the sector. So um, one question that um, I understand that you're interested in wrestling with is um, you're interested in looking at collective um, um, uh, uh, co-creation and collective um, uh, framing of um, what is important, and but also the collective redistribution of who then benefits from um, that uh, investment. Um, what are some of your thoughts for um, the council that you're leading? Um, I understand that you have recently published your first briefing, which is yeah. specifically applied to COVID and vaccine. Um, do you want to share with us some of the thoughts that um, your council has yeah. been thinking about on how do you reframe um, value and how do you um, make public and private co-create and um, that would lead to um, distribution to especially those that are most in need, et cetera? Sure. Um... 
So first of all, as I mentioned, the council was set up in order to say, if we care about health for all, because it's called the, the WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All, right? So health for all being an ambition, a global ambition, backtrack and what does it mean for how we think about innovation, value, uh, uh, financing and finance and the design of public-private partnerships. And so, and, and unfortunately that's often not done. We're, what we often do is sort of how the question before framed it, which is how much money do you have and what can you do with that? So you think of trade-offs, you know, are we gonna invest in health or education? If I'm gonna cut a bit there in order to release there. So mm -hmm. to start actually thinking about this as opportunity creation, that you are again shaping and co-creating markets and that expands the economy and that can expand the pie and that you're not always like, oh, should I cut you services or spend a little bit more uh, around health? I mean, that, that requires a reframing of again, how the economy operates, different types of cross-sectoral kind of multiplier effects. But also, you know, what we did in that first brief was to say, because it actually wasn't on the vaccine, it was motivated by it, but we said, the idea of um, you know, the patent waiver, which is getting a lot of international attention around the vaccine and the countries and organizations that support it or not, the kind of people's vaccine um, point, we said this, you have to step back a bit. It's not just about the vaccine. It's actually about lots of the issues that I began with, which is how do you govern health innovation for the common good? So it's not just about give away the patents, let's first also understand how we've abused the patents, how we've allowed patents really to be more about value extraction instead of value creation. And there's mm -hmm. lots of lobbying efforts for that. Uh, often when, when people complain about you know, tax evasion and tax avoidance, they say, well, do you know that the tax policy itself has often been designed by <laughs> uh, you know, particular kind of non-democratic forces because no one even knows about it, it's just through lobbies. You know, GSK, for example, was one of the companies that in the UK lobbied for the patent box, which is a very mm -hmm. problematic uh, policy for the reasons that I said. It just increases profits. It doesn't actually increase investment in innovation because that's already been taken care of through the patent itself. And you know, again, R&D tax credits, you can devise them in different ways. There's some smart ways to devise them, but how they're often devised is just a, a, a way that ends up post facto increasing profits rather than galvanizing new investment that wouldn't have happened uh, anyway. So by mm -hmm. thinking about value as collectively created, I think that's a really important point because so much of the pushback by industry, and I'm not against industry, but we need to unpack the arguments from industry, but also from governments, which also say problematic things. Much of the pushback from industry with doing anything around intellectual property rights is that, oh, then it's gonna you know, disincentivize us to innovate. And the first answer is like, all right, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, let's see who's, you know, that much wider ecosystem that is doing the innovation in the first place. Uh, much of the value-based pricing kind of, you know, uh, uh, rhetoric and theory is actually based in some ways, one could argue, on the value itself just being created uh, by business. So allowing prices to basically go to what the market can bear and then different uh, welfare states having to subsidize it. That's the, the taxpayer paying two or three different times. So, you know, um, if you actually look at where companies move, and I remember when Pfizer closed down a plant in Sandwich, Kent, um, and Pfizer was, again, a company that lobbied very hard in the UK around particular tax policies, when it moved that particular year to um, be closer to actually a very large NIH-funded uh, lab near Boston, I thought, you know, that's the perfect reality. The, you know, the talk is reduce our tax. The, the reality is the walk is getting closer to publicly funded mm -hmm. or NIH or whatever um, right. uh, uh, funding. And I think if we had greater conditions attached to those public funds globally around what it means to be able to access this kind of social collective good of public funding, you know, that would be good. And to be honest, many companies that I speak to don't think this is a bad idea. I mean, especially mm -hmm. those, you know, Patrick Valance, who's who's now a friend and who used to uh, run R&D for GSK, you know, he agrees. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, and many people who, if you really speak to them, especially after dinner, they've had a couple of drinks, uh, who've you know, worked in the pharmaceutical industry, they'll admit that you know, they wouldn't actually be doing what they're doing without these other really important actors in the system. And yet the rhetoric, the story, and the pushback against functional and not regressive policies is often about oh, we're, you know, we're the innovators and you're gonna completely disincentivize us. And that's why incentives of course do matter. I mean, that's why I kind of you know, talked also about price schemes and there's other ways to uh, disassociate prices from, um, right. from innovation.
Great. Innovation. Well, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for such an inspirational talk and also the exchange and answers. And I think we provide a lot of food for thoughts for um, a lot of um, our audience and especially the young generation who is entering into this field and be inspired. And I would say also be bold and have courage to try on some of these new ideas and experiment and learn along the way. Um, there's no fixed solution, but you provided a very new way of thinking and that's most important. And we Thank hope you. to uh, invite you back and uh, see how much um, the field has uh, adopted some of your ideas into their thinking and work. So again, thank you. And bye-bye. Um, um, yes, thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. And um, for the rest of the uh, attendees, uh, let me now invite Luigi um, to um, talk to us about the um, Arrow Award. Luigi, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak very briefly about the uh, Arrow Award. Uh, so there is really, I just take five minutes. Uh, there are three things I want to say. One is just a, an introduction about the award. The second is to say thank you to a few people. And then the, the third is the most important to talk about the, the, the winners, uh, the, the papers in the last uh, uh, two years. Okay, just uh, about uh, uh, the award. This uh, was started about 30 years ago. Uh, and it's in, uh, uh, in honor of Ken Arrow for his 1963 uh, paper on uh, the welfare economics uh, of uh, medical care, which uh, we probably many of us know pretty well because we included it in the reading list of our uh, postgraduate training. Uh, and also th th this is one of the most cited uh, papers in, in health economics. And the reason for that is that, uh, you know, that that paper contains so many important issues for the health field that uh, you know, many, of the, many of the points that are made in that paper are, are still valid today. So what uh, this award tries to uh, recognize is the excellence and the innovation in the field of health economics, both on knowledge and, uh, and methods. So what the chair and the co-chair uh, does every year is to scan high and low for the best uh, paper across journal uh, topics, uh, health systems, uh, really ma many different uh, uh, dimensions. So, so that's what uh, what's, uh, the ARO uh, is, uh, is for. Now it's the time to say thank you to a few people. So first of all, I want to thank the co-chair, uh, who is uh, Tur Iversen at the uh, University of Oslo, uh, but also uh, very importantly, uh, the members of the um, of the committee who really do uh, the, the the really hard work of reviewing these papers uh, in quite a lot of detail and uh, and to and to rank this paper, which is really a, a difficult exercise because uh, most of the times uh, the reviewer says. Uh, uh, well, actually, they were all fantastic papers. So it was really hard to come up with with, uh, with, with the best one. But that, that's that, that's the difficult uh, job. Um, so I'm not going to list all of them. So I'm going to move to my last uh, uh, part, which is uh, to, to recognize the, the winner. So I think we can move to the next uh, slides. So, so the winner of the uh, of uh, uh, last year uh, award uh, was uh, on uh, uh, the effect of air pollution on health and mortality and medical cost. Uh, this time I'm going to read the, the, the names, but uh, I'm sorry if I will uh, uh, mispronounce them. So Tatiana de Ryugina, Garth uh, Hoytel, uh, Nolan Miller, David Molitor, and Julian Reif. So this paper uh, to me is, is uh, quite creative and innovative. It uses like a, a, an instrumental variable approach based on wind direction uh, to deal with the causality of uh, the effect of pollution uh, on health. Uh, and also it shows how uh, the potential harmful effect uh, of uh, pollution are probably higher than maybe what uh, was shown in the previous literature, and they are also not uh, uh, sh short term. So, so that uh, seems like an important contribution both for health policy and the environmental uh, policy. Um, now, th this year uh, uh, award, so the next one, please, uh, on the 2021, uh, our award is on a different, on a quite different uh, topic. So again, I'm going to read out the, the names: uh, Nava uh, Ashraf, Oriana Bandiera, uh, Edward uh, Davenport, and Scott Lee. So this paper looks at quite different uh, topic. That is one that actually has been there in the health economics literature for a long time, and is about the tension between financial incentives and prosocial motivation or intrinsic motivation. Uh, and what this uh, study uh, shows with the field experiment in, in Gambia is that uh, well, potentially there is a tension between the two, so that if you use more financial incentive, you change the composition of the prosocial uh, 
motivation, so that might reduce uh, uh, on average. But once you add like a recruiting stage, actually this trade-off uh, disappears, so that uh, uh, you know you end up actually with the people who are more talented are uh, uh, motivated in a similar way, and this has. Uh, no connect. What is shown in, in the paper is that this has a, a very positive uh, effect on health, uh, on health uh, through an improved healthcare utilization and access. Uh, so, in a country where there is a shortage of uh, uh, medical staff, I think the findings of this paper have uh, implications for the recruitment and retention of uh, medical staff. So, I would like just to uh, end uh, to uh, by congratulating. Uh, the authors for these uh, uh, two awards. And again, I, I thank uh, Ahia for uh, entrusting me for uh, uh, with uh, this uh, job and task. And I look forward uh, um, to, to next year, which will be my final year. Th thank, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Luigi, and also the committee for all the hard work and congratulations to um, the winners of the award. Um, so let me take this opportunity to also share with you the Adam Wagstaff Award. Um, the Adam Wagstaff Award was created last year um, after um, Adam passed away uh, in May. A group of his friends and colleagues decided to um, create this award to commemorate Adam's legacy in the area of health economics, the contribution that he has made to the life and well being of people who lives in lower middle income country in particular that have benefited from his research and also his commitment to um, nurture new generations of um, health uh, economists. Um, this is uh, funded by crowdsourcing and a number of people um, responded very generously to contribute to the fund. And uh, currently the committee is made up of um, six people, including um, colleagues from the World Bank, um, from University of Cape Town, um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, myself, and also Eddie's long term, um, Adam's long term um, collaborator and friend, Eddie Van Joslier. The two winners, um, the first one is um, uh, Nick, please. It's um, um, June Carlo whose paper on the effects of outpatient cost sharing um, show results that outpatient cost sharing actually can lead to high risk of mortality. And this is very new finding in the literature. And this is partly um, due to the mechanism of when there is an outpatient cost sharing, you would reduce um, the identification of um, health conditions uh, in a timely manner and also leading to actually increase emergency use um, also hospitalization in the long run. Um, the the co-winner, not the second winner, is Radhika Jain, um, whose paper on private hospital behavior under government health insurance in India demonstrated that when the state government uh, run uh, health insurance scheme increased their payment to private hospitals, actually only half of the increased subsidy went to benefit the patients, half actually get captured as ran by the public uh, by the private hospitals. Um, both of their work demonstrated rigor, answering new questions and questions that uh, of very significant um, policy relevance. And so uh, congratulations. And um, we hope that many of you in the audience will be the next winners. And with that, let me then um, invite Susan, Susan Clary, to um, tell us a little bit about the next Congress. Thanks so much, Winnie. So behalf, uh, on behalf of the Health Economics Unit at the School of Public Health and Family Medicine at the University of Cape Town, as well as all of our South African and African colleagues, I would like to extend a very warm invitation to the next AHIA Congress, which will be held in Cape Town, God willing, in 2023. So in a moment, we'll play the Welcome to Cape Town video, which was filmed back in 2019, and we showed this to you at the last AHIA Congress held in Basel. But we thought it was a good video, and so we're happy to show it to you again. If you watch carefully, you'll see our conference venue, the Cape Town International Convention Center, 
which has currently been transformed into a mass vaccination venue under the name of the Vaccination Center of Hope. And it is set to provide up to 750,000 vaccines by the end of this year. I very much look forward to a time when we can all come together again to reflect on what we are learning, to engage in informal conversations around a coffee station and to show off our dance moves while looking at the view of beautiful Table Mountain. Stay safe, enjoy the video, and I look forward to seeing you in Cape Town in 2023. You can play the video now, thanks. Thank you, thank you. On behalf of the Health Economics Unit at the University of Cape Town and our African partners, I would like to express gratitude to the International Health Economics Association for selecting Cape Town it's not to the next World Congress in 2021. We are humbled by your choice and honored that you have put your trust in us to deliver an exciting and exceptional conference. We will strive in every way to bring you an excellent program with an African touch with offerings that are attractive to an international audience. The University of Cape Town is an inclusive and engaged research intensive African university that inspires creativity through outstanding achievements in learning, discovery and citizenship. Advancing a more equitable and sustainable social order and influencing the global higher education landscape. We are the leading university on the African continent and one of the first to initiate health economics research and teaching with the establishment of the Health Economics Unit in 1990. Hosting the next I Hear Congress in Africa will help to raise awareness about the importance of health economics research and capacity development for population health and well-being, will elicit commitment from African players to institutionalize it, and will position Africa as an important contributor to the global health economics agenda. Recently voted the world's leading festival and events destination, Cape Town has plenty to offer visitors and we are confident that it is a city that you'll be excited to visit. forward to welcoming you to Cape Town in 2021. Thank you all for joining us, for joining this Congress and joining this centerpiece presentation. And uh, with that, uh, I will now formally um, close the uh, 2021 Congress. And thank you for your support. You don't have to wait until 2023 to connect with us. There are lots of activities that are being planned between now and next I hear. So please um, uh, stay well, stay safe, but um, continue to be engaged. Bye-bye. <laughs>